Uh, all right, so I'm pleased to introduce our colloquium speaker, Dr. Simon Locke. Uh, Simon completed his undergraduate education at the University of Cambridge, where he studied experimental and theoretical physics. Uh, he then completed his PhD from Harvard University uh, last year, working with Sarah Stewart on the formation, structure, and evolution of terrestrial planets. And then Simon moved to Caltech last year, where he's currently a postdoctoral fellow. Um, and he recently received the 2018 Pellis Ryder Award, which is given out for the best planetary science paper written by a student, like any student, for that entire year <laughs> for his JGR Planets paper, uh, The Origin of the Moon Within a Terrestrial Synestia, uh, which we're going to hear more about today. So uh, let's all welcome Simon and take it away. Thank you. Uh, there will be a test on pronunciation at the end. Um, and, and actually, I'm not going to give a talk. I'm just going to let this roll, and I'll see you in an hour. Uh, no, so uh, <laughs> uh, just to give credit, this is the uh, uh, simulation that was done, uh, sorry, a rendering that was done of one of our simulations by the uh, wonderful staff at the Adler Planetarium and uh, the University of Illinois. Um, and if you really need a good animation of your science, wait until the 50th anniversary comes up, and you'll, uh, you'll get them done. Um, this is actually currently on show in the Adel Planetarium in Chicago if you fancy uh, going. Anyway, so today I'm going to talk to you about moon formation and specifically the formation of our moon uh, and a little bit at the end about how we got from our moon to actually something that looked like our Earth and our moon. Um, but to start, let's go back to planetary science 101. Planets form by collisions. So you start with a gas and gas and dust disk. The dust magically sticks together in some way we don't yet understand to form asteroids sized bodies. Those collide together to make planet sized bodies and the planet sized bodies collide together to make the final set of planets that we see both in our solar system today and in other systems around other stars. Now the final stage of this process are what is known as giant impacts. So these are collisions between roughly planet sized bodies uh, definitions do vary. Um, and these uh, impacts are incredibly energetic. More energy is released in a giant impact than, for, uh, than from the surface of the sun in the same time period. And so these are very traumatic events for the plants involved. They melt and vaporize a substantial fraction of the silicate mass of the bodies. And because of the giant torques that are involved, in these impacts, you leave the post-impact body very rapidly rotating. Now, giant impacts have a particular significance for the Earth because we think that it is a giant impact that actually led to the formation of our moon. Um, and this has been the prevalent theory for moon formation for uh, over 40 years. And it is typically thought that we have a giant impact that ejects an amount of mass into, uh, into orbit around the proto-Earth out of which the moon accretes. And this is typically taken as the last major events in Earth's main accretion because it melts the Earth, sort of resets everything, forms the moon, and so sort of sets the initial conditions for the subsequent evolution of Earth. Now, for a very long time now, there has been quite a settled idea of what the moon forming impact looked like. And this has become known uh, as the canonical moon forming impact. And the reason there's been such a uh, sort of fixed idea of what a moon forming looked like is that there is a set of very powerful constraints, sort of first order constraints you can put on moon formation. Um, the most important, as well as the masses of the Earth and the lunar disk, the amount of iron that you have to put into the moon, the one that has proven to be most constraining is actually the assumption that the present day angular momentum of the Earth-Moon system was, has been the same over time. And so that constrains the angular momentum of the Earth-Moon system when it first formed. And actually, by a series of uh, uh, numerical simulations, it was shown there's actually a very narrow region of impact parameter space that actually leads uh, to, uh, can actually match these conditions. And this sort of comes, out of this comes the canonical moon forming impact, which is the impact you'll have probably learned about in textbooks or taught in, from textbooks in classes. And that is of a Mars mass impactor hitting the Earth at about the escape velocity um, and a grazing impact angle. And the traditional image is that 
kicks off, as in from this beautiful animation by nature, kicks off a disk of, uh, of material, mostly uh, liquid material, into orbit. And over time, that uh, material coalesces uh, to form uh, the moon. However, there are, an, although this does a very good job of matching these sort of first order uh, uh, constraints, there are a number of different things and different observa observations that have left sort of outstanding and have caused us to sort of reassess our understanding of moon formation. So the first of this is actually, I said they matched well, one of these is actually the, uh, one of these very fundamental considerations. And it's one that we typically don't talk about very much uh, in, in this field, which is that the con it's very difficult to actually get a satellite as large as our moon. So traditionally, when we have calculated how large the moon is that is formed from a disk, we use scaling laws that were developed from what are known as n-body simulations. So what you do is you just take all the mass that's put into orbit, divide it into little points of mass, let them gravitationally uh, interact, collide together, and form a moon. And this is probably the most efficient form of satellite formation that you can think of, almost. Um, and what you find is that if you take the array of published moon-forming giant impacts and plot the mass of the moon uh, uh, you would expect to form out of the disk of material that's produced, and this is the fraction of different impacts. If you took one of these uh, one of those scaling laws and said, I know how much material I put into orbit after my impact, what sort of mass moon would that form, you get a histogram like this. And so this, these are the results that are typically reported in uh, uh, these sort of studies. And you say that, look, most of the published uh, uh, SPH simulations of canonical moon forming impact produce something that's more than a lunar mass moon. Great, because we can always, like, we need room for error, right? So we need to have slightly more than lunar mass so that we can have some inefficiencies and, and be done. However, increasingly studies have shown that uh, the formation of a moon from a partially molten, uh, partially vaporized disk are actually incredibly complicated. And that there are various processes that lead to a lot less efficient accretion of moons than would be indicated by sort of end body simulations. And actually, if you used one of these uh, more sophisticated scaling laws that have been developed to translate your SPH impact into the mass of a moon, what you find there is there's only actually one um, of the published SPH simulations that get you more than a lunar mass moon. And so this is a, a, an issue, and it's one that's very much not settled because it's a very complicated set of physics. But there are there is questions as to whether the canonical moon forming impact actually gets you enough mass into orbit to form a lunar mass moon. This, so the second issue that uh, has been known about since the first analyses of the Apollo uh, samples is that the moon has a composition that looks very similar to Earth, except that it is depleted in its more volatile elements. And this isn't Necessarily, you know, if you work on planetary ices, this isn't what we're talking about in terms of volatile. When I say volatile, I typically mean things like, you know, gold, potassium, <laughs> cesium. Very volatile, right? You know, you see them floating around in the air all the time. Um, <laughs> but this is a, a very classic plot. Uh, this one from Rupert and Keeson in 1977. And what this is showing you is the amount of each of these elements that is in the moon relative to the amount of that element that's in the Earth. And what you can see is that for the what we will call refractory elements, things like magnesium, aluminium, calcium, you have that the Moon and the Earth are identical. But as you get to higher and higher volatility, i.e. as you go to elements that are easier and easier to vaporize, what you find is that the Moon is a lot more depleted in those elements than the Earth is. And this um, has been for a very long time interpreted as that the moon had a high temperature origin. What has been unfortunately lacking is the ability to actually reproduce this trend in depletion patterns with volatility. So there have been various attempts to sort of say that uh, you can get de volatile depletion, but to actually quantitatively match this depletion pattern has, has not been achieved within current uh, models. The other uh, outstanding issue uh, that we're going to talk about today, and one that has really consumed the field for a very long time now, is the observation that the Earth and the Moon are very similar, I will say that, nearly identical, in a whole range of different 
stable and uh, radiogenic isotope ratios. Um, and this has been something that's been sort of known about for a while, but as our measurement precision has become increasingly precise, it's become more and more worrying, because, uh, um, worrying, yes. The reason that we, this is surprising, that the Earth and the Moon have very similar uh, isotopic ratios for various elements is that we typically use the isotope ratios of things like oxygen, titanium, chromium, as sort of fingerprints of planetary material. So each body we look at in the solar system or each group of bodies has a unique uh, fingerprint of each of these isotope ratios. And pretty much everything we look at in the solar system, with some exceptions, has at least a somewhat different fingerprint than the Earth does. So we would have expected that if there was another body that was to come and hit the Earth, it would have a different isotopic fingerprint to that of the proto-Earth. And what we, but what we find in, in canonical moon-forming simulations is that 60 to 80% of the moon is formed from the thing that hit the Earth. And so we'd expect the moon to have inherited that isotopic fingerprint from the thing that hit it. And we'd expect the Earth and the moon to be different in these isotopic fingerprints. However, what we see is that's not the case. So this is uh, uh, the most recent of the uh, uh, attempts to look at an oxygen isotope difference. So this is a cap delta 17O. So this is a mass uh, in independent uh, offset in oxygen isotopes. And what they are showing here is that you have lunar samples here in uh, red. No, sorry. <laughs> the samples here in yellow. God. And uh, uh, terrestrial samples in blue and red. And what you can see is that uh, these two reservoirs are either, depending on which test you take, uh, resolvable but very, very small difference, or actually uh, unresolvable difference between these two reservoirs, which is not what you would have expected if the, the impact on the target had different isotopic fingerprints. And this is true for a whole range of different isotopes that people have, have measured. But it actually gets uh, more confusing than that, because not only are the Earth and the Moon very similar in what we know as a stable isotope, so these fingerprints that are set by the material you accreted from and have not changed through time, they are also very similar in isotopes in a well, in particular isotope tungsten, which is not just set by the material that you were formed out of, but it's also controlled by the timing and conditions of core formation. So. 182 tungsten is produced by the decay of 182 hafnium. Hafnium is a lithophile, uh, which means it wants to go into the silicate mantles of plants. Tungsten is moderately citrophile, which it means it preferentially wants to go into the cores. And so what happens if you have a core forming event, you separate the parent from the daughter nuclei, and so the two reservoirs evolve along different paths. And if you have two different bodies that have different sizes, have had different formation histories, they should very well, darn well have different tungsten isotope compositions. But when we measure the, uh, the tungsten isotope distribution of the Earth and the Moon, um, this, is, this particular plot here is from Tubal et al, 2015, but uh, there was a, compa there was a uh, study published in the same uh, edition from Kruger et al in Thilson Kleiner's group. And what you see is there is a offset between the Earth here at zero and the Moon here at 20. Uh, but the offset here is, can be completely accounted for by late addition of material to the Earth and the Moon, implying that when they first formed, the Earth and the Moon were identical, not just in those fingerprint isotopes, but in isot isotopes that track the processes of uh, formation of the planets themselves, which would be very unlikely to be the same between the two colliding bodies. Right. So these are our three unexplained uh, <laughs> um, things that we'll concentrate on today. And as I said, the field has mostly been obsessed with this latter uh, issue of the isotopes. And there have been a wide variety of different solutions that have been proposed. Uh, and I'm not covering them all here. But they vary from things like this first one here, which is basically saying, oh, what if the two colliding bodies were just the same? They happen to have been made out of the same you know, scoop of material from the solar nebula. And so they have the same stable isotope ratios which is fine, except you still have to explain tungsten. You could have had mixing between the planet and the disk after the impact. So you, have, you, you get more impacted material into the disk, but then you mix away those differences over time. However, that's been shown to be very hard to do on a dynamic, dynamical basis. 
because you have to exchange a lot of mass between those two reservoirs. You could also maybe make the moon out of multiple impacts, or um, uh, it has also been proposed that maybe we can actually get rid of one of the fundamental constraints on moon formation and say there are various mechanisms that it can actually transfer angular momentum away from the Earth-Moon system and transfer it to the Earth-Sun system, therefore slowing the Earth's rotation rate over time, which means that you can start with a higher angular momentum. And there have been various different, uh, there were two in 2012, particular impacts suggested uh, one of a two, uh, the one sort of illustrated here, of two half Earth mass bodies merging or potentially one very rapidly rotating body being hit by a, a smaller body that could potentially mix lots of material really efficiently in the impact, um, and then you have the angular momentum reduced after the impact by uh, tidal evolution. However, because you need very specific impact parameters to actually do the mixing, this has sort of not been particularly uh, accepted widely by the field. And so we're sort of left with this injunction where we have problems, we have some solutions, but none of them has proved particularly satisfactory. Now, psychologists assure me you enjoy a story much better if you know the ending, so I'm going to spoil it now um, and say that what I'm going to show to you today uh, is propose a new model of moon formation. And that is based on the fact that what we've found is that the uh, high energy, high momentum giant impacts that have been recently been explored for, uh, for moon formation actually produce a completely different type of planetary body, which we're going to call a synestia working on pronunciation, uh, <laughs> which is a continuous fluid structure that extends very far out. It's much, much larger than the present day Earth. And so when the moon forms, it actually forms inside the vapor of the synestia, surrounded by tens of bars of, of silicate gas. And that gives you an isotopic similarity. It gives you the moderate volatile and depletion and a large, massive moon. And then afterwards, you have angular momentum, tr angular momentum transferred away from the Earth-Moon system to the Earth-Sun system over the lunar tidal evolution. Right. Great. You know the story. You can go to sleep, wake up, be fine. Right. First part of the story. What the heck is a synestia? So to answer that question, I'll answer a much more fundamental question, which is what is the structure of rapidly rotating uh, fluid plants? So, um, what I'm going to show you are uh, cut-throughs, pressure contours through smooth particle hydrodynamic simulations. So these are the same codes that we use to model the giant impacts themselves. Uh, the reason we're doing this will become evident shortly. And what I'm going to show you is uh, for an Earth mass, all of the bodies I'm going to show you are Earth mass, Earth composition. All we're going to do is vary the thermal state, so make, heat them up, or we're going to vary their rotational state, we're going to make them spin faster. And so for this first case, this body has an angular momentum which is equivalent to the Earth-Moon system angular momentum today, and has an entropy of your favorite units, four kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin, um, which is basically this is a magma ocean planet. This is a completely molten planet, but without any silicate vapor atmosphere, or significant silicate vapor atmosphere. And what you see is this kind of looks like a planet that you'd expect. It's roughly spherical. Um, it's roughly the same size as Earth, give or take a few hundred kilometers. Um, but what happens if I start to heat this planet up? So if I start to pump more energy into this and increase the specific entropy of the mantle, what happens is that the molten planet starts to vaporize. And so you start to build up a silicate vapor atmosphere. And so the whole thing expands. And if I keep doing this, it expands and expands, and it gets really quite big. So what you have on the right here is something that looks more like a silicate gas giant than it does a, a, a terrestrial planet. There is no surface to this planet. It's uh, the first surface that you would hit on your dive through the mantle would be the core. Um, but what you can see is it still kind of looks like a planet. It's, as you would think of it, it's still spherical. It's still rotating as one uh, solid body. Now what happens if I play the same game with something that starts with higher angular momentum? So this is a planet now that has an angular momentum which is about two and a half times the present day Earth-Moon angular momentum. So you can see that this whole thing, because it's much more rapidly rotating, has a very oblate uh, spheroidal structure. Uh, and to, to, to help with what's coming next, I'm also going to introduce this new plot, which is the angular velocity as a function of radius. So these black points here are 
the sort of particles of fluid in the mantle of this, of this body. And here, they're all rotating at the same angular velocity. For reference, this red line here is the Keplerian uh, orbit. So if you were on a uh, purely gravitationally supported, rotationally supported orbit, you would sit somewhere on this line. And this is just a cut through the midplane of this, of this planet. Now what happens if I heat this planet up? What happens is it expands to the point that the equator of the body intersects the Keplerian angular velocity. And so you can't keep expanding this body and it remain rotating at a single rate. It sort of spills out into a disk. So the planet heats up, puffs out, and like part of it just has to flop over into the disk. And what you end up is this sort of very weird looking structure. It's sort of like a planet with sort of a fin in the equator. And if I keep heating, uh, and so this is what a synestia is. It is a planet that is too hot and, or, and too rapidly rotating to remain as one single coherent co-rotating planet. And you actually have to expand to the point that you have some disk-like region of the body at, connected to some inner co-rotating region, or that's typically what we find. There are various solutions that are possible. And the name synestia comes from uh, the Greek, courtesy of my uh, co-author Matthew Chuk, who much more elegant than our previous attempts, which was sin, meaning together, and Hestia, who is the goddess of architecture, the home, and the hearth. Uh, and so the idea is that this is a together planet. It is the whole thing is one continuous, thermodynamic and dynamically continuous body. And what happens is if I continue to heat this up, the whole thing expands, more mass is pushed into the disk-like region, and you end up with these sort of very expanded, uh, what the uh, Daily Mail helpfully termed a mega space donut, because uh, you can imagine if you swung this around, you'd end up with something that looked like a filled donut. So, you know, give something a fancy name, let the tabloids destroy it. Um, but actually, there are a whole range of different possible structures that you can have uh, beyond what we call the co-rotation limit, or the spin stability limit, where you hit uh, this limit where you can no longer remain a single, single planet. And actually, you can plot a variety here. So these, I should stress, are all Earth mass, all Earth composition. All that we are doing here is changing the thermal state, going from hotter from left to right, and the rotational state going from slow to fast. So increasing angular momentum down the page. And what you can see is that this top line is what I showed you before. So here you've, you start from, your, you stay roughly spherical, you just expand. But when you get to higher angular momentum, as you expand, at some point you intersect the Keplerian orbital velocity at the equator and you expand out these sort of um, uh, more donut-like shaped things. And you can see there's a whole range of different morphologies that you can get. Um, and once you get beyond this red line, once you get beyond the co-rotation limit, you have a degeneracy of states. You have a, many possible structures that you can have for the same uh, mass, angular momentum, and thermal state. Now, the interesting thing about this is that giant impacts are typically high energy, and they're typically high angular momentum. And so they put us typically down into this bottom right corner of this plot. And so what we see is after a lot of giant impacts, we end up with synestias that are hot, very extended, and very rapidly rotating. And so we asked ourselves the question, how does this change moon formation? If I, if I don't have a planet and a disk, and instead I have a synestia, which is very extended, how does that change how my moon forms after the impact? And to do that, we used, uh, again, we used an SPH model, the same model we used for the giant impact simulations, to try and uh, model the evolution of the synestia after the impact. And because we're focusing on trying to match the lunar chemistry, we are actually trying, what we're trying to do is instead of model the multi-component, multi-phase system, it's a multi-component system uh, itself, what we're going to try and do is track the pressure temperature paths of lunar material before they get into the moon, um, or as, as they're becoming part of the moon, to try and be able to predict the chemistry of the moon itself. So what I'm showing you here is very similar to plots I've shown you Previously, this is uh, the cut through of the pressure uh, uh, contours through, the, through this time, a synestia that's been formed by a giant impact. So this is an impact, I believe, between uh, two half-Earth mass bodies. And you've created this very extended uh, synestia. And what I'm going to show you um, 
And what happens is that because this thing is vaporized rock, it's cooling very rapidly. It has a surface temperature of about 2300 Kelvin uh, and cools over time periods of tens to thousands of years. And what that does is the cooling at the surface, at the photosphere, drives condensation of the silicate vapor that falls towards the midplane and inwards in the body, transporting mass and an angular momentum with it. Some of that mass uh, is accreted onto a lunar seed, which is formed out of the debris of the impact. Um, and because as you're cooling, you're transferring mass and angular momentum by condensates, you're also losing pressure support as you condense more of the vapor, the whole structure begins to shrink over time. And you'll see that happen when I show you this simulation. Uh, now, to do this, what we did is we modified the SPH code we use for our impact simulations, and there are a number of different approximations that go into that, which I'm happy to talk about. Um, but what I'm going to show you to sort of capture the range of uncertainty in some of those approximations is I'm actually going to show you two different estimates for the moon that is formed in this simulation. So one is to scale this black circle, and another, which is sort of a... Uh, a lower bound on sort of a weak lower bound on the mass of the moon that would be formed. And uh, the other is this blue triangle, not to scale, which accounts for the fact that the moon might accrete additional material that is not captured in our, in our, uh, um, in our parameterization. And this black line here is showing the border between where you are completely vaporized and where you have some amount of, of uh, stable condensate uh, stable in the structure. Right. So. On the left, I'm going to show you the evolution of the pressure contours. And on the right, you're going to ski see the mass of the two lunar estimates, so the blue and the black, evolve uh, with time. So go. Excellent. So what you see is that as you're cooling, the whole thing shrinks. But in, during this time, the moon is forming inside the vapor of the synestia, surrounded by tens of bars of, of silicate vapor. And this whole process is very fast. We did everything in, the, we, in this uh, parameterization. We ch made all of our choices to try and make the fastest moon formation we could to give us a lower bound on accretion timescale. And so what you see is that in the, in the black case, in the limiting case, most of the moon is formed within five years. Um, and that, um, but it takes a bit longer in the, in the, in the other case. We're still done in uh, fractions in a few years. And over time, what happens is the moon is formed and then the synestia shrinks inside the orbit of the moon. And you leave the moon in orbit as a separate independent body from the Earth. So you can see this as the moon is formed inside the synestia and it's sort of just left behind as the, the Earth, the, the terrestrial synestia shrinks within its orbit, carrying the rest of the material uh, with it. Okay. And now we've just got to the point that the, the second moon estimate is just emerging from the gas. Okay. So we now know the pressure at which the moon is forming. It is forming inside the synestia at pressures of tens of bars. That pressure varies a little bit depending on exactly what uh, post what impact occurred. But what does that mean for the, the chemical composition of the moon? So if you have your moon sitting in your uh, synestia with gas flowing around it, um, all of the chemical exchange between the, the moonlet and the gas around it is happening through a boundary layer. It's happening by recondensation and evaporation of that surface. And this is obviously a very complicated dynamical situation, but we can approximate the, uh, the thermodynamics of this boundary layer by looking at the uh, temperature of vaporization of the different components. So, yes. So what we're going to do is uh, what you can yeah so so if you have a uh, where, hold on, thank you if you have a moonlet that is in the in the vapor of the synestia it starts relatively cold it is liquid and it is heated by the gas around it so what I'm showing you here is the mass fraction of different elements and the total amount of mass in the vapor as a function of temperature for a material of bulk silicate earth composition these are calculations done by my co-author Misha Patayev. Uh, at Harvard. And what you can see is that most of the, uh, of the gas, uh, most of the condensate vaporizes in a narrow region of a few hundred Kelvin. And so if you start off down here 
uh, as a cold or relatively cold molten moonlit in the in the senestia and you're heated by the gas around you you start to vaporize but at some point the rate of vaporization rapidly increases now the amount of energy you need to put in to vaporize something that's a lunar mass is vast and so actually you cannot transfer enough mass enough energy to the moon in the time period that it is in the structure to actually vaporize it more than this uh, sort of onset of rapid vaporization. And so you, your, your moonlet sort of gets stuck at around a temperature at which you have this on, sort of uptick in vaporization rate. Yes. And so as well as knowing the pressure of vaporization, we can actually then infer the t sorry, pressure of moon formation. We can also therefore interp uh, infer the temperature of equilibration at the surface of the moonlet between the moonlet and the gas. And what you can see is that, for the, in this case, if you're stuck in this sort of temperature range, what you find is that most of the uh, major elements, things like silicon, iron, et cetera, are still in uh, the condensate. But any of the more moderately volatile elements, like here, example, sodium and potassium, these, the sort of pink and baby blue line, are mostly in the vapor. And so what you, you do is you set your composition, which is still has a roughly bulk silicate earth abundance of the major element, the major rock forming elements, but is depleted in the moderately volatile elements. So we can actually take these calculations and make a prediction as to what the composition of the moon would look like in each of our different models. So here I am showing you a uh, plot that I've only made because I work with geochemists, which is the composition of the moon relative to the earth, doubly normalized to aluminum. So by definition, aluminum here is one, so these are a range of different elements here. So aluminum is one. Anything that is below one is depleted in the moon relative to the Earth. Everything that is above one is uh, enriched in the moon relative to the Earth. And what we can do is we can use our understanding of the pressure uh, of equilibration, the temperature of equilibration, to actually predict what the composition of the moon would be. And for reference, what I've shown you here is this gray band is the range, is a range of different estimates for the lunar composition based on a range of different uh, historical estimates on, from Apollo samples combined with uh, lunar geophysics data. And what I'm going to show here is a range of different, uh, is the composition of the moon we will predict given different pressures in the midplane of the Synestia. And what we find is that for bodies that are in, uh, for midplane pressures in the range of a few tens of bars, we find that we can very uh, nicely pro uh, reproduce the composition of our moon. But if you go to too lower pressures, such as these, uh, this sort of tan and brown line here, or to higher pressure, this black line, you end up uh, sort of getting too much or too little of different volatile elements in the moon. Yeah. And so what we can do is actually forming the moon from a synestia can actually reproduce quantitatively the composition, in a simple model, the composition of the moon that we have today. So what about our other problems we talked about? What about the uh, isotopic similarity between the Earth and the moon? So the moon is inheriting its isotopic composition from the gas around it. It is equilibrating through the boundary layer, and so inherits the isotopic composition of the large uh, mass outer regions of the, of the Synestia, which are being mixed rapidly by rain and turbulent convection. And that can represent, and the mixing time for that is much shorter on the same time of weeks relative to the time scale of lunar formation, which is on the time scale of years. Um, and so the moon is equilibrating with a large fraction, tens of percent of the mass of the Earth, and is inheriting that isotopic composition, which really helps it remove a lot of the isotopic dissimilarity between the impactor and the target. But not all. So although mixing can do a lot to reduce any differences between the impactor and target material, it is not a silver bullet. It does not solve all of your problems. Because it is very difficult to mix the entire mass of the planet for two reasons. One is that there is a very strong density gradient uh, in the post-impact body. So what I'm showing here 
is for our midplane profiles of the specific entropy, so think up is hotter, down is colder, um, for a canonical impact and an example high momentum impact. And the colors here uh, don't matter, but what you can see is that you have a portion, which is actually a large mass fraction of your body is down here, it's relatively cold, but the outer regions of the body are very hot. And so actually to get this cold material to up, to mix with this very hot, low density material is very, very difficult dynamically and takes on a time period much longer than the moon formation. So there are sections of the Earth that are not gonna be able to be mixed, partly due to a density gradient, but also partly due to the fact that you have very rapid rotation and a strong angular momentum barrier to mixing material from the inside outwards. So to demonstrate that, what I'm showing you here is the mass fraction of the silicate mass of the synesti of different uh, synestias um, from a whole suite of giant impact simulations as a function of the, the energy of the impact. And the color code here is just the uh, ratio of the mass, uh, mass fraction of the impact relative to the total mass of the of body. So if you're up here at 0.5, you have two half Earth mass bodies colliding. If you're down here, you have a, like, you know, a tic-tac colliding. Um, um, but what you can see is that as you get to higher energy, more of the mass of your body is heated, more of it in this hot, higher entropy outer region, which can easily mix. So more and more of your, the mass of your body is mixing. But how much is a good amount of your body to mix? So to show you that, I'm going to show you uh, the real, uh, you can use a metric that was used by Young et al. based on their oxygen isotope measurements. And what I'm going to show you again is the impact energy. But on the y-axis here, I'm going to show you the, the compositional difference between the moon and the Earth, effectively, the bulk synestia. And so if you go to very, uh, and so this gives you an idea of the uh, sort of how efficiently uh, you need to mix. And what Young et al. found is that if you can get a difference that's below 0.1, so here, 40% of late moon forming impactors would be compositionally similar enough to the Earth to uh, explain the isotopic similarity in oxygen isotopes. Whereas if you can only do as good as 0.2, then only 20% of your impactors would actually be similar enough for you to get an isotopically similar Earth and moon. Now, if we assume that all of the outer regions mix, and they are that outer regions then impose the isotopic composition on the moon, which is what we expect to happen. What we find is that there is a range of different uh, differences that we get for uh, the uh, between the moon and the synestia. What we find is that there are some cases that get down into this region where it's relatively probable that you'll end up with mixing between the impactor and the top that the that the post-impact mixing will be sufficient to erase the signature of, uh, of, the, of the impactor. But I should point out that most of these are actually very highly tuned to optimize mixing. They're from a data set that is originally made for one of the original, uh, for the original Chuk and Stewart 2012 paper. So these have been optimized to optimize, to optimize for mixing. And actually more typical impacts, which are these more multicolored ones here that we sort of picked out at random, uh, I have actually very low probability of explaining the uh, isotopic similarity between the Earth and the Moon unless the impact and the target are at least somewhat similar. So the thing is you don't have to have an impact and a target that are identical to, to explain the isotopic similarity, but they still have to be relatively similar. And I think this is a constraint that holds for all moon forming models and actually puts a very tight constraint on, on planet formation in our uh, solar system. So uh, finally, what about the mass of the moon? So the great thing about high, high angular momentum impacts is that this is not a problem. Um, you eject a lot more mass into orbit, uh, and so you have a lot more material to go at to actually form a moon. So if you remember the simulations I showed you, even our lower bound or weak lower bound mass was a lunar mass. And so there are a range of different impacts. And I should stress that a range of different impacts from uh, you know, half Earths to sort of uh, you can have a load of different different mass ratios that actually form a moon, uh, a synestia that's capable of forming a lunar mass moon. So, in summary, 
what I hopefully have convinced you about is that there are a range of giant impacts that actually drive the Earth to become a synestia. And that by becoming a synestia, you trigger a series of events that leads to uh, the formation of a moon. And if the initial synestia was suitable, drive you to forming a moon that looks like ours. And that is because equilibration within the vapor pressure of the synestia actually imposes on you the moderately volatile element depletion uh, that we observe in, in lunar samples. And that after the impact, you have angular momentum that is removed from the Earth moon system during lunar tidal evolution, uh, evolution. And this is actually the first model that's been able to explain a lot of the both geochemical and dynamical aspects of, of moon formation. However, that is not the end of the story. After the moon forming impact, <laughs> your Earth still looks, and you formed a moon, your Earth still looks like this. It is a swirling ball of silicate vapor that is rapidly rotating, and it has to go a long way before it can get down to something like the Earth that we know today. And actually, if we were to draw this to scale, it would be something more like this. And so there is a large period of Earth's history that has largely been neglected, going from a very vaporized post-impact body back to something that even looks like a magma ocean, never mind looking like something that looks like the Earth today. And there are, this is important because the different moon formation models predict different starting points and different evolutions during this phase. And there is potentially different geochemical predictions that you can make by looking at how the Earth evolves during these early phases. And actually, there might be traces of, uh, of moon formation still left on Earth today. And to show you a, an example of that from a paper that was just published last week, the pressures after different moon form pressures in the interior of Earth after different moon formation scenarios are very different. So what I'm showing you here is the core mantle boundary pressure in gigapascals for, and I'm going to show you, is a range of different uh, post-impact bodies of different angular momenta here in units of the present-day Earth moon angular momenta. So just to reference you on this scale, the present-day Earth is somewhere up here, the tick of this uh, uh, boundary here. And what I'm going to show you are planets that all have masses between 0.9 and 1.1 Earth masses. And so what these gray bars are showing the range of core mantle boundary pressures for bodies of those masses at an angular momentum of the present of the moon of the sorry, <laughs> angular momentum of the Earth today and the angular momentum of the present day Earth moon system. So in, assume that all of the angular momentum was in the Earth. Yeah, and there's the Earth today. And what we find is that there is a huge range of post-impact pressures. So you can have core mantle boundary pressures that are as low as 60 GPA in some high angular momentum moon forming models. And so what this means is that if you're at a canonical impact like these blue points up here, your pressure is you know, 10 or so GPA lower than the present day, but it's relatively similar. But if you have a high angular momentum moon forming model, you actually are over here somewhere, and you have a much lower core mantle boundary pressure than we have been assuming. And this is important because the, the pressures in the mantle control things like uh, partitioning of elements during core formation. They can, yeah, sorry, that's highly. They also control how the Earth freezes after, uh, uh, after giant impacts. And then they also uh, set up a different situation going forward during lunar tidal uh, evolution. Because obviously, if you start down here, you have to get back up <laughs> to here somehow. And so during uh, the condensation of the post impact structure and lunar tidal evolution, you have a, lo a series, uh, a long period, or relatively long period, of increases in, in pressure. And so this sets, this has potentially a number of different predictable geochemical observations we can actually make. Um, just to show you the fun last bit. This is the pressure. I'm going to show you the pressure contours inside the Earth during lunar tidal evolution. So this is, after an example, high momentum moon forming model, you have quite an oblate Earth. You have a core mantle boundary pressure of 98 GPA, and you have a 2.6 hour day. So you know, come back in 2.6 hours, and it'll be a new day. Um, and what, it's going to change color. Sorry, there's a horrible glitch in that the update last night has introduced. Um, but what you're going to see is that as the moon tidally recedes and the angular momentum of Earth is reduced, 
you're going to see the pressure in the body increase and the shape change. Oh, that's so horrible. And you see as the, as the planet returns to being spherical, you can see that the pressure at the core mantle boundary increases back to something that we'd recognize uh, as the present day. Yeah, and there are various aspects of this period of, of Earth's evolution that have not been considered. And there are very interesting geochemical predictions that we can make from this. And so what I'm working on now is trying to link the sort of subsequent evolution after the moon forming impact to things that we can use to then go back and test, uh, provide additional observational constraints on the moon forming impact uh, itself. So thank you. Um, I, the, one of the uh, things that people either like or really hate about this proposal is that we cannot tell you what the impactor was. There are ranges of impacts that work, but we have found uh, potentially moon-forming SNESs that are formed by half Earth mass bodies. So both the, both the two originally proposed, the Chukin-Stewart 2012 and the Knup 2012, form SNESs, and a subset of those impacts form suitable SNESs for moon formation. Well, we found things, everything in between. We found a 0.73 mass putting a 0.3 mass, 0.8 putting a 0.25. There's a whole range of different impact parameters, velocities, et cetera, that get you into, that produce a suitable synestia. Um, and so the answer to your second part of that question is sort of dependent on the first, because each of those different impacts produces a slightly different synestia, but more importantly, also does a different amount of mixing during the impact itself. And so there's this trade-off between what the impact was with how much mixing you have to do afterwards. And um, there is definitely work to be done in constraining that phase space, but it will be a phase space. It's never going to be like in the canonical impact. We're never going to have a simple thing of going, that was the moon-forming impact. It's, it's, we now have to consider a much larger range of moon-forming impacts, which makes a lot of calculations much more complicated, but uh, is sort of the reality of the system we're dealing with. No, and actually we're taking the logical step that actually the Earth's chemistry today was set by the two bodies that collided to make the moon, with the exception of things like the highest hydrophile elements, which are influenced. And so in some ways we take the logical step that that is the composition of the moon you get, so that must have been the composition of the moon, you, the, the senesia you had after the impact. It's entirely numerical artifacts. Um, so the, there are issues. One is just annoying the applauding artifact that, that uh, it's a very sparsely populated um, uh, space. So the way that SPH works is it divides the fluid up into a number of fluid particles. And for numerical reasons, each of the masses of those particles needs to be relatively similar. Otherwise, you end up with uh, uh, more serious numerical errors. And so in the outer, in the, in the very low density regions of the body, doop, 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 uh, what the heck? <laughs> it doesn't really matter, it's very far back. So in the outer uh, regions of the body, actually, let's move on, go on back. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the outer region of the body, you have a lot of volume is represented by a single particle. And so what happens is by interpolating between those sparse particles, you end up with quite a jaggedy uh, uh, structure. And so that's why you occasionally have the odd kick out is because a particle either drifts in or out of the, the slice. And so you have sort of just something like a particle that happens to be there, and it's not. And it's a, it's a computational artifact that we'd love to get rid of, uh, but we haven't found a, a neat way of doing it. Um, so that's actually really interesting, and the reason, uh, we, so we were very worried about this, that we were actually just seeing something that should go unstable, but actually what saves you is the fact that you have m concentrated your mass into the center of the potential well, and so in order to split it out again to either become two bodies or to form a bar structure, you have to overcome that potential 
well, so actually, if it was a uniform density body, it would be unstable. So uh, uh, for a lot of the, um, uh, because you've not got that barrier, but because you've got that much higher potential well, it's stable to those sort of perturbations. And we haven't done, it's something I'm working on just to do a much more formal, um, dense, uh, formal analysis that would actually do the perturbation theory and, and do that. But we've tested it empirically b using the simulations because the, the SPA simulations are very dissipative. If there is any instability or, uh, say, a lower energy state, it would evolve towards it. Um, and the other thing is you can do uh, analysis based on the, the energy budget. So you look at the ratio of the kinetic to the potential energy, and you're well below any of the criteria that people have calculated for simple systems like galaxies and, and spheroids and, and things. Sorry, you had a question here. I'll come back. <laughs> Uh, the question is how, how does that affect the issue? Oh, definitely, yes. So, um, uh, yes, uh, your point is very well taken uh, about the, the uh, sort of streaming stabilities and, and how the creation things, yes. Um, a sort of, it was kind of what I was referring to, the magical step in between somewhere. <laughs> um, but yes, th that is definitely a possibility, so you can miss a collisional step. But for the, the collisional cascade you're talking about is, yes, these impacts create a huge amount of debris. Uh, you can eject up to 10% of an Earth mass in debris. And that, uh, where that goes is an interesting question. So there have been some studies about this that have some uh, issues with them, but they predict that uh, sort of a large fraction of that ends, ends up coming back and hitting the Earth on a, you know, up to 10 million year time scale. Um, and others, parts of it are perturbed onto Jupiter crossing or go into the sun or a lot of it goes to Venus. Um, and so that is interesting uh, in terms of what it does for the chemistry. So people have argued, so there are geochemical traces of accretion that happened on the Earth after the core was closed. So that means that when you, when you no longer separate iron out into the core, however, there is the potential that some of that material is delivering, some of the material that's impact debris is actually delivering some of those geochemical signatures. So you might not be seeing late accretion, you just may be seeing yourself coming back around and hitting you. But in terms of the evolution of the, of the Senestia, you have, it does provide an additional heating term uh, because a lot of that material is going to be coming, it's going to be being broken up in the outer regions of, of the body. Um, and so that's, it's not a huge contributor on the time scale that we're talking about for moon formation because you only have, you know, 10 to 100 uh, orbital um, times before the moon is formed but it definitely can play an interesting role on the subsequent evolution of, of Earth before it becomes sort of a planet as we would know it. You had a question? That's right. Yeah, yeah, you. Um, Oh, yep, yep. Oh. oh, so this is, this is a, a calculation. So yes, so this is a calculation that's basically looking at the length of day right. over time. And so, you know, you hit present day, you know, between those last two time steps, and I just ran this all the way to a non-rotating body, just because. And then, how, what is the time scale of that actually happening? And how does that compare? Because that would affect the, um, the tungsten ice slip, wouldn't it? So and that would then be different than when the moon formed itself in the beginning of the Senestia, right? So by the point of lunar tidal evolution, most of, well, the main stage of core formation is done. So this is mostly happening after you solidify your lower mantle because that happens on a time scale of a thousand years or so. Okay. 
whereas tidal evolution is thought to be more on the regions of uh, tens to hundreds of thousands of years and up. But there are orders of magnitude uncertainty in that time scale because we don't know the tidal properties of um, partially molten vaporized bodies very well. Um, uh, so the nearest sort of equivalents we have are the gas giants and stars, but neither of those we understand particularly well either. Um, Uh, so, so they don't migrate. So, okay. So, the the importance of the pressure is when the metal is separating out into the core. So, we think that the last the last, but the the canonical uh, way of thinking about it is that the last time that the metal really sees the mantle is just before it gets taken down to the core, and that's when it exchanges its uh, the elements with the mantle around it. So, the more pseudofilms go into the metal, the less pseudofilms stay in the mantle. And then that is sequestered into the core, and then you cut off communication between the core and the mantle when the lower mantle solidifies. So the pressures that you record in that equilibration step is set in the sort of the few, you know, uh, sort of days after the impact when you still have metal that's settling through the the the. Um, sort of vapor and then lower molten lower mantle. And potentially you have extra additions based on like later accretion that's being kicked in, but most of it's done by then. And then once you freeze the lower mantle, you sort of segregate it, and then you have, you're then evolving the pressure forward. And that doesn't reset that exchange. It, it's already preserved, preserved in. Now the, there have been suggestions that you do have back reaction happening that we may be observing at the present day, but that's a, uh, Likely to be a low mass fraction, maybe. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, sorry, I have a question. I'm no. curious if you find it's more, you know, a couple of moons or a flash of something settling and it burns and then grows. So you typically, um, in studies that have had multiple satellites, you typically find they accrete to a single satellite very quickly or they end up forming two satellites in resonance, and then at some point they go unstable. Um, so there are definitely the potential for multiple moons having been formed and then later uh, uh, collided. It's been investigated by a couple of people. Um, typically it's found that the single moon, particularly in this case where you have a lot of gas drag uh, to damp uh, uh, mutual inclinations, you probably end up with just a single moon, but it's, it's something that can definitely be. There is a grad student working with my former advisor, Sarah Stewart, who's looking into this and sort of actually putting bodies into the Senestia with gas drag and seeing how they evolve. Like, do they gas drag their way in? Do they remain stable? Where do they accrete from? Do they form one or two moons? That sort of questions. So Mars is big enough. Uh, it just would require a more energetic impact. So the, um, the, the issue is that you are unlikely to form a synestia unless you get significant amounts of vaporization. And vaporization for silicates typically kicks in around five or six kilometers a second impact velocities. And so for Mars, for Earth, you can easily do it with an escape velocity impact. But for Mars, you need to start ramping up the, the velocities to get enough vaporization. So again, it's a trade-off. But yes, there's no, there's no reason that you can have um, a Mars mass uh, synestias. And actually, in, when you get to more massive planets, it's kind of inevitable. Because you have so much vaporization, um, you end up actually, uh, I haven't, the actual numerical simulations come, but sort of scaling arguments would suggest that actually you become much more likely to form synestias as you go to like super Earths and things, because your uh, impact energy scales as v squared basically, and your torque scales <coughs> less strongly than that. So then, super Earths are likely to have large moons. So this is a question we were asked, and it's not necessarily that they're likely to have large moons; they're likely to be synestias, but it might actually be harder to make 
comparative, like the mass ratio. So they're going to be large. There's going to be a lot of mass, but the mass ratio might not necessarily be that high because there's a difference of getting mass into orbit and a mass into orbit beyond the Roche limit. Um, and, and to actually answer that question will require active numerical uh, simulation. The nice thing about going after, after not so much super Earths, but sort of mini Neptunes in terms of, not in terms of their radius, but in terms of their composition, uh, is that those bodies, if they have a water vapor rich atmosphere, could actually last for long enough in theory for tens, maybe hundreds of millions of years that we could actually have a chance of seeing them, which would be really, really interesting. Um, and we'll take one more question, and then if anybody else has questions after that, feel free to come down and talk to Simon after, but I think we'll wrap it up after this one for time. Well, uh, just get someone to fund me. Uh, no, um, <laughs> the answer is that they have very distorted shapes uh, in their transit light curves. So there are two ways. One is you could do it spectroscopically, but I haven't worked a way of actually doing, working out the degeneracy of just a planet with a, with a hot silicon atmosphere and a senesia or a post-impact body. Um, so what, ideally you want both, but actually if you can imagine this thing passing in front of a star, it's like a giant bar of soap. So the duration of your transit is much longer than the equivalent uh, depth. And if you had, a, particularly if you had a mass and velocity, it would look incredibly low density. It would be incredibly low density, it would be, have a weird transit shape, and if you could follow it with spectroscopy, that would give you three points. And it, it wouldn't necessarily confirm it was a synesia per se, but it would definitely show it was a post-impact body. And I think that would be a really interesting way of doing it. And um, I'm, it's one of the many things to do on my to-do list. I calculated some light curves and actually to compare them to like, what, what the sensitivity of current instruments would be. Because obviously, one of the issues is you're looking at quite young stars, and young stars are varying. And so there have been a lot of success in sort of taking the longer wavelength variation out, but obviously that adds a lot of uncertainty into the actual transit depth and transit duration measurements. But it's whether you would be able to still see through that to get, uh, to be able to clearly define a synestia versus a planet. So we'll see. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be great if we can. I will be so happy in like 20 years, so she'll see me screaming running around. But um, yeah, we'll see. So, all right, with that, let's uh, thank Simon for his talk.